Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. I'm delighted to see this uh, crowd, and I'm sure uh, you won't be disappointed. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Seema Jayachandran. Seema is a professor of economics at Northwestern University, uh, but she took a rather circuitous route to get there. Uh, she started out uh, uh, with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from MIT, and then went on to do physics as a graduate student at Harvard, um, and then somewhere along the line <laughs> discovered economics uh, and has been there ever since. And I should say that I, you know, this is really a, a, a a great move uh, 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 for, for many reasons. Uh, you know, if you look at the kind of work she does, uh, there, there's some common themes, uh, one of which is, is, as you will see, is very rigorous and very interesting problems. But there also, you, know, sh you can tell that she cares deeply about some of the world's poorest people. Um, and the work is all about trying to improve the lives of, of, of the people who are uh, uh, distinctly underprivileged. Uh, the, the other aspect is that Seema is not only a producer of extraordinarily valuable research, but she's a promoter of other people's research. Um, as an editor of several uh, journals from time to time, and if you sort of follow her, her tweets and her uh, uh, blog posts, you can see that she's trying to uh, get a movement going in some, some areas where drawing on people's work. And I'd say that one of the things I appreciate is that she takes work of some people, and when you look at, when you read the papers of, of those people, they don't seem as interesting as when she writes about them. Uh, <laughs> and I still remember one of them is from somebody here, Klaus Deininger's paper about uh, the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in, in India, uh, which, uh, and, and the effect on agricultural wages. And Seema wrote a very nice uh, New York Times column showing how this is illustrating a, a broader principle about how government intervention can actually help break down monopsonistic behavior among, um, uh, uh, among uh, rural landlords. And that's the kind of public good that we, uh, we uh, benefit from, from somebody like Seema Jayatandran. So Seema's topic today is about gender inequality in India, uh, obviously a topic of great interest uh, around the world. And so welcome, Seema. Thanks, Shanta, for that introduction, and thanks all of you for coming. Uh, the topic is, is gender inequality in, in India. I'm not going to cover that entire topic. Uh, what I'm going to uh, try to do today is start out with a very big picture take on the link between gender inequality and economic development kind of worldwide, and then focus in on, on India, uh, specifically talking mostly about one aspect of gender inequality, namely a preference uh, for sons in India, and give you a synthesis of some of, of my research and my views on, on that theme. And then the last part of the talk, I'm going to do a deep dive in one of my projects, current projects, that's trying to uh, address gender inequality in India, both some preference and gender inequality more broadly. Uh, so can I, in terms of thinking about the link between gender equality and economic development uh, and cultural norms, you know, first fact that probably a lot of people in this room know is that on many measures of gender inequality, it's worse in poor countries. So this is a figure from an annual review of economics uh, article I wrote, which is it's a very simple correlation, which is on the horizontal axis, it's the GDP per capita in the country. And on the vertical axis, it's the ratio of men to women who are going to college. So a higher value of that is a gap that's favoring men. And you can see this downward sloping relationship on the right, in the richer countries, that gender gap is smaller. And in fact, in richer countries, more women than men are going to college. And as you go to the left with the poorer countries, that gender gap is getting bigger. And this is college. This is the ratio of men to women in college. You would see a very similar pattern if I showed you secondary school enrollment or primary school enrollment. You would see something similar if I showed you measures of health, like life expectancy. You know, women outlive men almost everywhere, but that natural biological advantage gets diminished in, in poorer countries. And it's also true for softer measures 
uh, of well-being like personal freedom. There are world value survey questions about whether you have freedom to make decisions in your life. And in uh, poorer countries, women uh, are less likely to, to uh, have that freedom or believe they have that freedom relative, relative to, to men, and, and that seems to be, to be um, less of a problem in richer countries. You know, so one takeaway from this broad fact is that in thinking about gender inequality, uh, we, there's gender inequality in the US, in Sweden, but the problem is even bigger in poorer countries. And so it's an important uh, topic to, to think about in thinking about economic development. You know, there's another optimistic way to look at this correlation and, and say, you know, this could be the result of uh, something causal where as countries get richer, the gender inequality, different measures of disadvantage for women and girls get smaller. And you know, if you did, if you looked at, again, correlations, but within countries, you would also see a rather optimistic uh, story where as countries get richer, these gender gaps get smaller. So as Bangladesh or India or the US uh, advances, women are, are catching up to men on many uh, measures. You know, and, and there are also pretty broad theoretical reasons why we would expect economic development to uh, narrow some of these gender gaps. So this illustration is, is, is uh, laying out three of those big reasons. You know, one is on the, on the left, it's the structure of the economy. With the structural transformation, you know, jobs and oc occupations move from things that require a lot of physical strength, like agriculture, to uh, more of the economy being centered on services or other jobs that require brains, and women are going to have a comparative advantage in, in as, as the economy shifts towards mentally intensive um, tasks. You know, the middle panel is uh, showing you know, a woman fetching water from a standpipe, and with development, that home production becomes a lot less labor intensive, and because women do the lion's share of that home production, that, that technological progress and that uh, sort of solving these problems with capital rather than labor frees up women to have more attachment to the, the labor market. And then finally on the right is uh, sort of representing the demographic transition, that at early stages of development, family sizes are, are large, fertility, childbearing is risky, family sizes get smaller and childbearing becomes less risky uh, with development, and that again is going to improve women's labor productivity and their attachment to the labor force. And so, you know, as women are gaining in terms of their labor productivity, in turn, that's going to give stronger incentives to educate girls, and it's going to give women more power in society to make sure healthcare spending is, is uh, more equitable across genders, uh, and it's going to give them that freedom of movement. You know, so this doesn't mean that we, this doesn't endorse laissez-faire policy. We might want to have policies to speed up the progress uh, for women, but it is suggesting that on a lot of metrics, the process of economic development might be narrowing gender gaps. You know, so a, a lot of my work on this topic has ended up focusing on, on dimensions of gender equality where there isn't as much um, progress over time, where we aren't seeing gender gaps narrow over time or with economic development. And it's not shocking that, you know, not, not everything fits this neat story that, that with economic progress the gaps narrow because economic factors aren't the only thing explaining why some places have more gender inequality than other places or how it's varying over time. You know, a lot of, a lot of these patterns are uh, driven by cultural norms that vary across cultures and, and that are, are quite deep-seated. And so an example of that is a preference for having sons. Uh, so one of the, maybe the starkest manifestation of, of that preference for sons is the uh, skewed sex ratio, where today you know, many parents are determining the sex of a fetus uh, while the, the fetus is in utero and then selectively choosing to abort female fetuses. And so that means that the sex ratio among births is going to be skewed towards men in some places. And so this is the same type of figure I showed you earlier, except here now what's on the vertical axis is the male to female sex ratio. And there, you know, this is not fitting the same pattern that I showed you with education or that I said exists with health. Here, there's no downward sloping relationship. If anything, it's a little bit positively sloped, but it's small. But there are big outliers. You know, they're also big in terms of 
their population, but India and China, uh, among other countries, are the isolated places where this is a, a very large problem. So this is something where if you look at this problem worldwide, it's the, the outliers, not the general patterns that um, really are what stand out. And I'll show you a figure later on in the talk that these are also have been getting worse rather than better over time. So this is something where uh, it doesn't seem like we can uh, be sort of leaning on pro eco standard eco economic progress to understand and to solve uh, this problem. So I want to make one distinction, a useful distinction between uh, what we mean about, about son preference, and, and that's the desire for an eldest son versus the desire for sons in, in general. And you know, as I've been working on this topic, I think I've increasingly uh, come to the view that, that to, to understand certainly the fertility patterns, it's a strong desire for an eldest son that uh, is, is what's driving behavior and, and useful to have in mind, and rather than a desire to have all sons. And the patterns of the skewed sex ratio fit this idea in the sense that people aren't having a sex selective abortion on their first child, or they're not having sex selective abortions to make sure they don't have any daughters and they have the majority sons. They're very, uh, very starkly having sex selective abortions to ensure they have at least one son. So sex, the skewed sex ratio is concentrated in families where prior to that birth, the family had no uh, sons, so when they had only daughters and they wanted to have uh, at least one son. And I'll show you some other kind of preference data uh, later on that's consistent with this. And so, you know, that, that means in sort of thinking about where, what are the roots of this or where should we be thinking about changing norms or addressing policy, you know, it, it, to me it means that certain, certain uh, usual suspects might not be that important or might not be the, the central uh, factor in explaining the skewed sex ratio. So for example, dowry, I think there are lots of reasons the dowry system uh, is terrible and it certainly is affecting how much parents are spending and investing in their daughters versus their sons, but I'm not sure it's the first order explanation of the skewing of the, uh, the sex ratio. That's not, you know, other people will uh, disagree with me, but that's sort of my take on, on thinking about this strong these many patterns that su suggest there's very much a desire to have um, at least one son and, and to put prominence on that eldest son. Uh, okay, so what are, you know, what, what is the root of, of eldest son preference? So I think a big one is, is patrilocality. So if parents, uh, when they're older, they're going to be supported by and live with their eldest son. So there's a, uh, a reason to, in, to put primacy and invest in this and want this eldest son so that he can care for you in old age. Uh, you know, along with that, there's patrilineality of, of passing on your lineage so that uh, a family line doesn't end because there's no son to carry on that, that family name. You know, at least in some places, there's, it's also religious rights. So in India, an eldest son is going to light his parents' uh, funeral pyre and in, you know, in China, some of these same cultural roots exist as well. There's patrilocality of parents being taken care of by their eldest son and uh, ancestor rights where an eldest son plays an important role. So on the right of this figure, of this slide, I've put a figure from a, a working paper by Avi Ebenstein where he did a, a, a nice simple exercise. He took the demographic and health survey surveys and the census data that's publicly available and on the horizontal axis, it's the fraction of elder, elderly men who co-reside with a son. You don't know if it's an eldest son because these are census data where you're not taking the entire birth history, you just know the household roster, but you know these elderly men, the household, their household head is a, a son. And then on the vertical axis, it's the, the sex ratio, and you see that in places, so this is this horizontal, this variable plotted on the horizontal axis is the measure of patrilocality or a proxy for patrilocality. And you see that in places that have more of this patrilocality, there's a more skewed sex ratio. And so those places on the right, you know, it's the, the places like India and China and Vietnam, and also uh, maybe less well known, it's the Caucasus. The Caucasus region has a, a very skewed sex ratio. So Christophe Gilmodo and other demographers have pointed this out, and I'll come back to this 
this point uh, later on in the talk, but you know, one of the big factors that explains why the caucuses have, have in the past couple of decades really had the skewed sex ratio is they've had very dramatic fertility decline after the fall of communism, you know, from down to 1.5 or, or below as a, as a uh, total fertility rate. Okay, so there's a, another dimension of exceptionalism in India related to gender inequality, and I'm not going to talk much about it or in, in this talk. I originally thought I would cover both of these aspects of India's exceptionalism on, on gender inequality, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna focus more, mostly on sun preference, but this is certainly worth at least mentioning it. And so there's an unusually low female employment rate in India. So this, uh, you could probably recognize I borrowed this figure from The Economist, and they've sort of plotted uh, uh, female labor force participation as an inverted U with, or a rather a U shape with GDP per capita, and India is below that prediction line or that best fit line. Uh, and you know, I think some of the same desire for sons might be at play here, but at least my take on this is that this probably has a different cultural root in the set, uh, you know, one, maybe a indicator of that is that it's not the same set of countries that have a skewed sex ratio that have unusually low female labor force participation. It's not China, um, uh, it's not China or Vietnam. The places that are similar to India and having an unusual female labor force participation are uh, in, you could see here, Pakistan and Iran labeled. A lot of them are in the Middle East. And so, you know, here there's also a, a kind of a cultural uh, norm or cultural preference for sexual purity of women in India as well as in the Middle East that I think underlies a lot of this um, restricting women's physical mobility and kind of trying to segregate them uh, from, from men outside their family where the workplace is, can, can become a problem for that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it would be, I, I've thought a lot about whether there's some unifying theory of why India stands out in these two reasons and I think they're probably uh, a little bit distinct in their roots, you know, nonetheless, I think they reinforce each other. If women are not working and are not going to be able to be as economically productive, that's just one more reason why people might prefer to have sons rather than daughters. And then in addition, the fact that there's a skewed sex ratio, that there are 50 million more men than women in India, you know, that's, that's going, that is leading to a lot of men who are unmarried or marrying later than they wanted. And there's uh, reasonably convincing correlational evidence that you know, that skewed sex ratio, that shortage, that surplus of men is associated with increases in sexual violence and um, sexual harassment, which are uh, very certainly big factors in keeping female labor force participation low in India, as well as keeping college enrollment of girls low. Okay, so I'm now gonna talk about, uh, go kind of speak in more detail about the strong desire for an eldest son and some of the consequences of it. Walking through uh, a very brief tour of three of my projects that think about this, this um, topic. So one more distinction that I think is, is useful to make, you know, this term sum preference is very broad uh, and it encompasses both a desire for sons, you know, wanting to give birth and have sons in your family, and then also to provide more resources to sons than daughters. And on both of those dimensions, you know, India is, looks worse than most other countries in the world, including most other poor countries. You know, I do think there's, they, those two different aspects differ in that you know, gender gaps in, in spending on kids exist at low levels of development in most societies. You know, if you go back to the very first figure I showed you, you saw that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a large gender gap in education favoring boys. And if you look back historically in the US, there was uh, a gender gap in education favoring men that has uh, narrowed and, and reversed. Um, and you know, the, 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 but in contrast, this desire for having sons is not seen everywhere every, in every country that's poor, and you don't see it historically if you look back in the US or Europe. And so one nice signature of a, of a desire to have sons is that the last child in a family will be disproportionately male. So you know, long before people had access to sex-selective abortion, there was, they would be trying to have a son, 
And so one signature of that is a, a stopping rule where the, you're continuing to have kids until you have enough sons. And so what that means is the last child in a family is going to be disproportionately male. It doesn't skew the entire sex rate, population sex ratio, but that those last children are sons. And so you can go back, that's nice because you could go back historically and look in the US or Europe and you don't see this pattern. So uh, this is not something that's seen everywhere. So you know, I, putting that all together, uh, both of these aspects of son preference are uh, present in India and important for understanding outcomes, but this desire to have a son is, is certainly the more unusual uh, and exceptional one. Okay, so in thinking about how people, if you want an elder son, how does that affect fertility, there are two broad strategies you can use, which I've already alluded to. So one is you can keep having kids. So after you had a daughter, you haven't had a son yet, or you haven't had as many sons as you want, and so you continue to have children. So that was the main option people had until recently when uh, sex, select, sex selection, uh, sex determination technology came along. And continuing to have kids to have enough sons remains an important way that people uh, achieve their desired number of sons. Even if you have access to abortion, there are a lot of reasons people might not want to engage in it. So this hasn't become obsolete as a, as a way families are, are um, satisfying their son preference. You know, more recently, uh, with the advent of especially ultrasound, having a sex selective abortion is now common and is certainly uh, a big factor in this increasingly, increasingly skewed uh, sex ratio. So there's also, you know, I should mention not a here, there's also infanticide and you might have some, you know, kind of intentional neglect of daughters, but in terms of, you know, the primary ways people are, are trying to get their desired number of sons, these are the two approaches. And I'll talk about two projects that sort of fit in this left bucket and one that's about sex selective abortion. Okay, so you know, what happens, why is it bad for child health and especially girls' health if you are trying to have a son? You know, and the theme here is that uh, girls' health ends up being hurt as an unintended consequence of this desire to have a son. So it's sort of bad enough that parents intentionally will give more resources to sons than daughters, but on top of that, there's some collateral damage to, to girls uh, from this quest to have a son. So one way it's going to affect a family if they're trying again to have a son is that it's going to affect the spacing after birth. So after a girl is born, her, uh, it's much more likely that her parents are going to want to continue having kids, you know, often with a shorter uh, birth spacing because you know, they might have some in-laws or uh, community members putting some uh, explicit or implicit pressure on them to have a son, and so that's gonna, to, uh, mean daughters are followed by another child in the family uh, relatively quickly. A second implication is that the family size is larger than originally planned. So you were hoping for sons, you had a daughter, and so you continue ha having kids, so your family size is larger than uh, you expected. So this point that family size, that girls are in larger families. This is a point that um, Kazuo Yamaguchi made uh, theoretically and Shelley Clark has, has looked at. Girls are going to be in larger families than boys on average. Uh, and as I'll show you, there are some additional consequences from the fact that this was unanticipated. And so these are gonna have negative consequences for child health. So one of my projects, my first project on this topic was with Ileana Kuzemka was looking at uh, breastfeeding in India and first demonstrating that boys are breastfed for longer than girls. So this is the survival curve. The, at each age, it's what proportion of kids are still being nursed. And you see this red line, the dashed line, which is boys, it's above the blue line, boys are breastfed longer than girls. And so it's on average uh, one month longer. And so the, you know, first of all, this has health consequences. So it, 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 you'll notice that at up to six months, there isn't a, a gender gap. And in a US context, that's where we focus in terms of the immunological and the kind of main health benefits of, of breastfeeding. But in poorer settings, the, you know, the alternatives to breastfeeding are often less nutritious, they're less hygienic, and so 
the being breastfed is help is healthy uh, is is improves children's health. So you know this in this project that's. It's, we're not making advances in estimating the causal effect of breastfeeding on health, but we take some, some numbers off the shelf and you know, run some associations and do a back of the envelope calculation. And it's a, there are about 15,000 extra excess deaths of girls in India each year because of this gap in breastfeeding. So it's important as a, you know, both in terms of just the absolute number of, of children who are dying be, because of this and as a not small proportion of the excess female mortality that you see between age one and five in India. So one way of explaining this fact is that parents know that breastfeeding is help, healthy for kids and they wanna do more good things for their sons than their daughters because they care more about them or they want them to be healthy and productive later on. That's more important to them. And so you would see some, you would see a gender gap in India in lots of health inputs, like vaccinations and taking kids to the doctor. You know, but this project, the kind of punchline of this work is that that doesn't explain most of the gender gap in breastfeeding. That explains a little bit of it, but most of this is not a conscious decision to provide something valuable to sons over daughters, but as this unintended consequence of this quest for a son. And so, you know, how do we test between these two ideas or decompose how much of it is, is from this fertility continuation? Uh, this was a fun paper to write because it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, there's no causal effect of X on Y. We write down a model and that has many predictions and uh, look in the data if there's support, support for them. And I think kind of collectively the evidence is, is pretty convincing. And so, you know, so why is, first of all, why is quicker, why is the birth of a daughter going to um, lead to less breastfeeding? So, you know, after the birth of a daughter, if you want to get pregnant again to have a son, it's going to lead to earlier weaning. First of all, because some people know that breastfeeding reduces your ability to conceive. So breastfeeding lowers your fecundity. If you're trying to have another child, this is not something that's, you know, this is something that's working against you. And so people will choose to breastfeed less. And that's certainly part of what's going on. You could look in the demographic and health surveys and a decent number of people seem to be aware that breastfeeding has this contraceptive property. But that's not all of what's going on because not everybody knows that. And you know, at these later months of nine months or 12 months, breastfeeding is not a, you know, a very effective form of contraception. You could still get pregnant. And so a lot of what's going on is just that the subsequent pregnancy is often what triggers you to wean a child. So you're breastfeeding your younger child, you're breastfeeding this daughter, you're trying to get pregnant again for a son. When you do that, you will stop breastfeeding that younger child, you know, whether that's be, uh, because of the physical demands of being pregnant and breastfeeding and fatigue, there are you know, various reasons, but uh, in the data, that's often the moment people stop breastfeeding. Okay, so what is the signature of this fertility stopping as explaining this gender gap? You know, it's really that there should be this largest gender gap when the family would have stopped having children had they had a son, but because they had a daughter, they continued because they didn't have enough sons. And so this is that, you know, we sort of have various predictions of various ways of looking for this in the data. You know, one of them is using the questions that are in the demographic and health surveys, or it's the National Family Health Survey in India, that ask you about your ideal number of kids and their sex composition. And so, you know, what do we predict? When you haven't even reached your ideal family size yet, you're gonna continue having kids whether you had a son or a daughter, so you shouldn't see much of a gender gap. It's only when you've, you would love to have stopped having kids, except for not having enough sons, that you should see this difference between a daughter and a son affecting future fertility and therefore breastfeeding. And so that's what this figure is showing you. What's on the horizontal axis is the child's birth order minus the family's, the mother's ideal number of sons. So when that's negative, you're gonna continue having a child whether you had a son or a daughter. So this fertility continuation story would predict there's no gender gap. And you can see there's 
uh, there is a little bit of a gender gap. So part of this is just like vaccinations or trips to the doctor that parents seem to want to be doing more for their sons than their daughters. But you can see that you know once you go, once the family has reached its ideal family size, then you see the gender gap widening at zero and one and two. This is where the difference between having a son versus a daughter is really important for how much you breastfeed that infant. You know, a second way we do this, it's those ideal family size questions have the, you know, the retrospective, uh, not everyone loves them. So we have another prediction that's just using birth order. The, uh, where kind of the prediction is that at low birth order, you are gonna continue having kids regardless of whether you had a son or a daughter, so that gap should be small. And then it should widen, and it should actually narrow again later on because at some point you're gonna stop having kids even if you don't have a son yet. You know, if you've had five daughters or six daughters, uh, and the cost of enlarging the family size even more might not be worth it. And so you could see this red line and blue line, the gap starts out smaller and then narrows, and then the orange is that gap plotted. Uh, I like this figure because I think of all of the figures I've done in my papers, this is the one where we have this prediction that uh, it should be non-monotonic and it should peak around the typical family size in this period of which is about 3.7. And so this is like, you know, nothing in our simple model predicts this level of symmetry, but you know, I, this, uh, this is an example of a prediction where the data, you know, fit it better than we expected. Um, okay, so the second project on this theme is a project with Rohini Pandey, which didn't start out about sun preference. It was trying to understand this puzzle that Indian children have a high rate of stunting. So they have a high rate of stunting because it's a poor country and nutrition and disease affect height. But the puzzle is that Indian kids are short relative to other poor, poor uh, parts of the world. And so uh, this project, you know, this figure I think is the the probably the, the biggest contribution of this paper, which is it's just a fact that the gap between India and other poor places is very much concentrated at later birth order. So here we're using sub-Saharan countries as a comparison group. The, this comparison group is, is poorer than India, yet if you compared India to sub-Saharan Africa, Indian kids are shorter. But what this is showing you is if you look at first births, there isn't a gap. Indian kids aren't abnormally short if they're birth order one. All of the puzzle is driven by second births and later born children. So this is just the raw data. The paper has a battery of tests to, to sort of think about, try to separate birth order from family size, controlling for completed fertility. We use other, you see the same pattern if we use other comparison groups of poor countries regardless of their geography or if we even concentrate on Bangladesh and Pakistan or we compare places that uh, geneticists would say have the most genetic similarity to India like in West Asia. Uh, and so this fact, you know, that, that birth order, that the puzzle is varying uh, across siblings because we can also look at this comparing siblings within a family, you know, I think it's important because, I mean, first and foremost, it, it's hard to square this with genetics being the explanation. So I don't think many academics think genetic differences could explain why India has a high rate of stunting, but it's a very common um, layperson reaction and it's an easy thing to lean on in the policy circles to say this isn't really a problem, we don't need to address it. You know, our genes are not systematically varying with our birth order. You know, I also think this is important because there, there are other factors affecting stunting in India, like sanitation, but that can't explain everything. It's not that you know a firstborn child will have access to good sanitation and then his younger siblings won't. That you know this this pattern is really is is not going to be something where you can. It's an uh, an infrastructure infrastructure is the problem. You know, so I think this is kind of this is a much trickier problem to solve. This is really about decisions parents are making among their kids. So this is height, but we can replicate this same pattern if we looked at inputs, health inputs. That in India, the drop off in. Um, prenatal care visits or vaccinations or postnatal visits, they're much steeper in India than elsewhere. So there's a birth order gradient everywhere. You know, first, first births are our favorite everywhere. It's just exceptionally steep in India. And so there's just a lot of evidence that this really seems to be a, an active decision by parents of how they're treating their subsequent children. And so as I said, this project didn't start to be about some preference, but then it sort of raised this question for us of why is there this steeper birth order in, in India than elsewhere? 
Uh, and that's where sun preference comes in. So first of all, you know, once you think about eldest sun preference, that's going to generate a birth order gradient among boys because of giving more resources. Once you have your sons, if you favor that eldest son because he's going to be the one taking care of you, you're going to give him more resources. And so he might not be birth order one, but he has to be a lower birth order than his younger brothers. And so you'll see this birth order gradient uh, among, among boys. You know, so then it still raises the question, we see a birth order gradient among girls as well. And that's a little bit more subtle why that's related to eldest son preference. And it's related to the fertility continuation. So the birth of a girl prompts a couple to revise their fertility plans and have more children they were originally intending to. So I'll tell the story with myopia, but it, it, the same reasoning goes through with rational expectations. You know, if you have a, if you wanted to have two kids, which is the most common preference in, in India right now, you know, you have a first daughter and you say, okay, great, I'm gonna get my son on my second birth, and so you're gonna give her some resources. Once you have a second daughter, that's, a, that's bad news for you because now you're gonna have to have more than two kids. You're gonna, you know, again, with myopia, you think you're gonna have a third kid and you don't have any extra resources. So your household income now needs to be spread over a larger family size. And so you have to adjust and you're gonna adjust by cutting back on spending on your existing children. And because those first years of life are so important, that second born daughter is going to get fewer resources in that uh, early important stage of life, you know, because the, the, you've, you've, the spending on your first daughter is already in the past. And so this is a case where you're going to get a birth order gradient among daughters. It's not that there's some special role in, in Indian families for an eldest daughter compared to her younger sisters. It's not parallel to sons. Nonetheless, because of this quest for a son, you, you get this uh, unequal treatment of daughters within a family. Okay, so the, 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 there are lots of tests of this in the paper. I think this is this maybe the cleanest, simplest way to, uh, to show you that there's eldest son preference seems to be explaining or important in understanding the stunting puzzle in India. So what I've plotted here along the horizontal axis is GDP per capita and the blue dots and the, are the sub-Saharan African countries and the line is the best fit line. And on the first panel is girls, and you could see that red triangle of India is below the regression line. Indian girls are unusually short if you thought what would mattered was, was the level of economic development. You know, maybe more surprising to you is in that middle panel, if we look at non-eldest sons, they're also very much below the prediction line. They're much shorter than their counterparts in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's, you know, when we go to the, the third panel of eldest sons, they're below the regression line. There's still other factors like sanitation that mattered, but they're much, the puzzle is much smaller. They're much closer to the regression line. So there's something about eldest sons that's distinct from other sons and distinct from daughters. You know, the other way to see that something about some preference matters here is that the green triangles are plotting Kerala in the northeast. So those are the matrilineal parts of India that have less of this eldest son preference. And you see across the board, the, those green triangles are much closer to the, the, what you would predict if you use sub-Saharan Africa as a comparison group. Okay, so the, the third project I wanna summarize is, is related to this using sex selection. So as I promised, here's, the, uh, here's a graph of showing you what's happened over time. And in both India and China, the sex ratio has become much more skewed you know, from the mid-80s through uh, 2010. And so what's going on, you know, mid-80s is when ultrasound machines became available. And then as uh, everybody knows, you know, the one child policy also kicked in and put some pressure on families uh, to, who wanted a son. So now they had only one shot or, you know, with, uh, with exceptions, but that the laws requiring a smaller family came into conflict with this desire to have an eldest son. And so, you know, the, the, what's going on in India, it's not as steep, but that second factor is also important. So no one was coercing people to have one child or a smaller family, but with economic progress, with the demographic transition, people wanted to have smaller families over time. And so as they want to have smaller families, that starts to uh, butt up against this desire for, to have an elder son, which wasn't uh, 
declining with, in lockstep. You know, and the logic here is, is simple, that if you had a family with five kids, there's only a 3% chance you're going to end up without a son naturally. And you know, this is the fertility level in the 60s. So you know, today it's 2.5, 2.6. Now there's a 24% chance that within those two kids, you aren't going to get a son naturally. It's a little bit less than a quarter because the natural fertility rate isn't, uh, sex ratio isn't exactly 0.5. And so that means, you know, with, as you, if you want to have a smaller family and you still want to have an eldest son, there's going to be a greater need to sex select as your desired family size falls. So, uh, so I have a project that's trying to, to look at this, and it really has two goals. One is to, to try to revisit and, and um, make some changes, improvements, or innovate on the way we ask about fertility preferences to get at this question, and second, to quantify you know, how much has this fertility decline contributed to the skewing of the, the sex ratio. And so the basic idea of this, of, of this was to ask survey questions that try to separately understand how much some preference you have and, and your desired family size. Because the challenge is there's an existing paper that sort of took the demographic and health survey, the NFHS, and said, you know, when we look at families that want smaller, a smaller family size, they have a less skewed sex composition, desired sex composition. So ergo, as family size falls, that will improve the sex ratio. But that's an erroneous uh, conclusion because some families are you know, more traditional. They both want bigger families, and they have stronger son preference. And then other families are uh, more modern or more progressive, so they have, want smaller family size, and they have less son preference. So that's not the right exercise to understand if family size falls, what's going to happen? And so this just asks people their desired sex composition at some hypo different hypothetical uh, family sizes. And so here you could see you know, it's, it's stated preferences, but it's a pretty stark picture that at a family size of one, the vast majority of people want a son. You know, so that, they, that people, are, people really want to have a son. And actually, you know, at larger family size, they don't want they don't want all sons. You know, so the preferred, with a family size of two, people want uh, one boy, one girl. That's their bliss point. Yes, they'd much rather have two sons than two daughters, but they don't want uh, all sons. And in fact, at desired family size of four or more, people want a majority girls. And so you know, this, they would rather have three daughters and one son than two than three sons and one daughter. And that's not necessarily for reasons to celebrate. You know, girls are more docile. They can help out with household chores. The, when you ask people, they say, you know, if we had too many sons, we'd have conflicts of splitting up the land. Nonetheless, it, means, it shows you that, the, that this desire to, you know, that it's not that people want a son, a daughter only want sons and, and just have a real aversion to having daughters. And so, you know, this is another fact that for me says, okay, dowry doesn't seem to be lo looming at the top of people's minds as they're thinking about the composition of their family. You know, and then the other uh, fact for, or conclusion from this paper is that the, so using these preference data and some other methods, it seems like this decline in the sex in the desired fertility is contributing about a third to half of that skewing of the sex ratio in India over time. It's a quantita quantitatively important factor. And, you know, and it's not over. There's going to be more fertility decline in coming years. And so that's a, you know, a reason that uh, this problem will be with us uh, and maybe worsening for a while. So I find this problem of missing women and fertility decline, you know, especially um, vexing or maybe depressing because it's a case where, you know, economic, it's a very stark case where economic development seems to have worsened the sex ratio. You know, we usually think of technological progress as great. Here, that technology of ultrasound enabled sex selection and the demographic transition, which we also usually think of as a, progress, a, pro, a progressive change, has led to this skewing of the sex ratio. I think the irony is, is worse than that in the sense that there's been progress on women's rights and it's worsened the sex ratio. You know, so women have more ability to have smaller families now. They have um, both more bargaining power and access to contraception. There's access to safe and affordable abortion. But this, you know, this combined with the sun preference not changing has, is, is a, a major contributor to the, skew, the, the problem of, of missing girls. 
you know, and I think it's also challenging when you think about the policy solutions because, you know, we usually think increasing women's bargaining power is a catch-all solution to helping girls and women. But, you know, improving women's agency and women's empowerment, you know, for example, through women's education may not improve the sex ratio. So female education leads to women wanting to have fewer sons at any given fertility level. So that, you know, my, my data, I, that, the analysis can show that. So, you know, as a measure of, some, if you think of that as a measure of some preference, at any given fertility level, they care less about having a son. And so that's good. F women's empowerment does seem to be reducing kind of this notion of son preference, but it's also having a major effect on women wanting to have smaller families. Uh, and, and having bargaining power to, to act on that. And so you put those two together, you know, that first force is gonna be good for missing girls, reducing the number of missing girls, but that second force is going to exacerbate the problem. And it's not obvious at all when you put those together that women's education is going to help the, the sex ratio. And so, you know, kind of it's, in, in the data, it looks like, if anything, kind of women's education is associated with a slight worsening of the sex ratio. And you know, the same reasoning could go through if you think about policies that might give women more access to employment opportunities, that they're going to be uh, dueling pressures, which is they might have more bargaining power because of that economic power, but they're also, it's also going to um, push down their desired fertility level. And if this intrinsic, or not intrinsic, but this cultural desire for a son doesn't change in lockstep, um, you know, the, it's, uh, the problem of missing women isn't going to get solved and might actually get worse. Okay, so in the last uh, bit of the talk, I want to talk about policy responses to sun preference and focus on one of my uh, recent projects. So first of all, I think this is a case where the government uh, of India, you know, I don't usually have many positive things to say about nationalistic uh, leaders, home or abroad, but you know, this is, a, I think on this issue of, of sun preference, uh, this government has put it front and center on its agenda, you know, and, and sort of focusing on equality for the, for the girl child. So some of that is, you know, to, could be like an intrinsic value of the human rights, or it could be because, you know, it's about modernity. India doesn't look like a modern society if it has this skewed sex ratio and is constraining women. You know, I think there's also this practical concern of having tens of millions of unmarried men is not good for uh, civil rest. You know, that, that's going to be um, a problem that, you know, I don't think any government wants to face. And so whether it's for uh, idealistic reasons, you know, noble reasons or pragmatic reasons, this is a problem that the government finds it a problem that there are this many uh, missing women. And so what are the policy responses? So first of all, there is a... There's an, uh, a not toothless ban on sex selection, sex selective abortions, of, of uh, revealing the sex of a fetus to parents. And it, there's enforcement behind it. There'd be some laws that I would say these are just on paper. I think this one, there's some real meat behind, um, behind solving it. Nonetheless, you know, the sex ratio, uh, the project I'm going to talk about is in a state where the you know, sex ratio is hovering around 1.2. So clearly the enforcement is not enough. Now, the other kind of policy that's in place in several states in India is to offer financial incentives to parents to have daughters. So if you have one daughter or two daughters and then one of the parents gets sterilized, you get cash payments and sometimes you know, a savings bond that pays out when the daughter is older. And that's how this project of mine uh, started, which is the government of Haryana, one of the states in North India, was interested in tweaking and evaluated in, in evaluating its policy of financial incentives to have daughters. And so the, the project we ended up doing with them is quite different. So we you know, counter-proposed uh, taking a totally different approach. You know, I think this is one where I projected my own views on this project quite a bit. You know, I think these financial incentives, they're really expensive, uh, and it's just not obvious they're gonna be a long-term solution. There's even an argument that they might crowd out you know, intrinsic valuation of girls. In any case, we were just interested in pushing the government to think of a, a broader set of policy tools to address this. So I'm gonna talk about this project on reshaping adolescence gender attitudes with Devadar and Tarun Jain. Uh, and so this was, we, it's working with the government because they gave us permission to work in schools. And so the, uh, the project is working with an NGO breakthrough where they designed and delivered a curriculum in school. So the government let their staff take over the classroom in, in government secondary schools 
uh, once every three weeks for two and a half school years. So we worked with two cohorts. They were in grades seven and eight at the beginning, and then over the two and a half years, they, the last year, they were in grades nine and 10. And so this is a, it's a very discussion-based uh, intervention of, of where there's a, a clear point of view and a message, but it's also trying to get kids to interrogate their views. And the idea is that by thinking about and discussing with one another both the human rights and the economic arguments for gender equality, this will move them in a direction of having more support for girls and women's equality. And so, you know, one thing that's exciting about this project, uh, nerve-wracking at times, is that, you know, we designed this study to follow these kids for a very long time. I'm going to show you what we see in the short run with attitudes, but ultimately you'll see we have a big sample and that's because ultimately we want to, if not, we might not be able to track the kids for, for in 10 years, but their parents will be pretty stable and so we could ask them about their daughters or daughter-in-law's completed education. They, we can ask them about their grandkids. We don't have to ask them if anybody had a, a sex-selective abortion, but just asking about their grandkids is enough to, to see if, they, if there's a less skewed sex ratio. So when we designed the study, we you know, chose a sample size to have t t statistical power to detect changes in the sex ratio. So why did we, you know, why were we keen to focus on schools and work with adolescents? You know, so I, I think the idea is that this is a deep-seated cultural norm. It's not obvious you know, that it's going to be easy to change. That's not my expertise, but it does seem that you need to, to kind of get at this preference for sons directly, and, and young people have more malleable views than, than uh, maybe their parents do or the elders in society. I think there's a kind of a meta goal for this project for me, which is that schools can be an important vehicle for teaching morality or human rights, uh, trying to support human rights, you know, and are a way to counterbalance messages that children are getting at home or in the community. So this is clearly a case where the government is ahead of most people in Haryana in wanting to solve this problem and thinking eldest son preference is a problem. State schools, you have a captive audience to, to try to, to shape attitudes. So there's obviously, you know, some gray areas and there's a slippery slope. I think in this project, I'm, I'm comfortable that we're on the sort of, you know, right side of, of human rights in, in trying to promote gender equality. And so, you know, while this program, we're sort of now starting to talk to the government of Haryana about where do we go from here, and I think the idea is not to have in the long run, you know, NGOs teaching this, but to maybe hire special purpose teachers. I don't think you could get regular school teachers to teach this, they probably disagree with lots of the, the messaging, but you could hire teachers who um, are on board with this message, who cover many schools and teach this. Or you could also embed some of the ideas in textbooks. So Breakthrough is a gender human rights NGO. They designed 27 sessions uh, and they led them. And the topics had a range. You know, so they talked about gender-related attitudes, aspirations, girls versus boys aspirations, talked about uh, tolerance of other people's discrimination. There are a couple sessions on communication and leadership skills. You know, and this is an important point that having a pro-gender equality attitude might be necessary but not sufficient to actually change your behavior. You might need to convince your parents to let you stay in school, for example. So some of it was uh, communication. So uh, the, as I said, the, the discussions were, the sessions were very discussion based. So this is Breakthrough's picture. It's maybe cherry picked to have uh, lots of hands up. But you know, in general, this was a very interactive program. In fact, you know, the, the uh, education secretary, when we, there was a new education secretary. He was really concerned that this was hurting people's, you know, crowding out math or something else. My own take is that this is probably good for kids overall because, you know, they whatever the topic, just having to um, have more discussion and and um, critical thinking is is probably the Indian school system needs more of that. So here's one session that I like to go through because it for me it sort of hits home how. Uh, you can sort of move people along by having a discussion with them. So there's a session where the kids break into groups and they talk about who does various chores in their household, who does the cooking, who does the laundry. Then they get back together and they share their answers and lo and behold, girls and women do all of those chores at home. And so then the facilitator asks them, you know, why is that the girls and women are doing all of that? Is that fair? And usually someone will make the point that girls and women are better at these tasks than men are. And, you know, and then the facilitator will say, well, who does those tasks out in the marketplace? Like, who are the cooks in restaurants? 
who does, who are the dobies, who are, who does laundry out in society? And the answer is men. So, you know, then it's, then the discussion is, okay, so if women are better at this, why are men doing them outside? You know, if a woman is a great cook, she, wouldn't it be better for society if she was able to cook for more people? And there's a discussion of whether, you know, that what, doing this task at home versus in the marketplace, are they accorded equal status in society? You know, and so this is one where I can imagine some kids having a backlash reaction. I can imagine some being um, unimpressed. But, you know, I think for a lot of them, they just haven't interrogated these assumptions they've had, and this is sort of making them think about something that they've always taken for granted a little bit differently and might make them um, have more support for, for gender equality. So this project is in four districts in Haryana that uh, they're adjacent to Delhi. So these are, these are the districts that have the worst sex ratio uh, in Haryana and, and very high on the list for all of India. And this is back to, you know, they're rich places adjacent, relatively rich places adjacent to New Delhi. So there's very low fertility and um, ability to afford abortions. And so this project in the end is not really just about the sex ratio. It's most, much broader, but the original conception of it was because uh, to our focusing on these places where the sex ratio is most skewed. So we, it, we ran a randomized control trial in 314 government secondary schools. Uh, so we don't have statistical power. We don't see differences between co-ed schools and single sex schools, but I'll just say as background that 215 of the schools were co-ed and 99 of them were single sex. So we did a baseline survey in 2013-14, then the program ran for two and a half years and we did an end line uh, a few months after the program ended with 14,000 kids. The, um, so let me just convince you, if you're not convinced, that the starting point were pretty um, undesirable attitudes towards gender equality. So this is showing you from our baseline survey answers to at qu attitude questions. Most of our questions are taken from um, other surveys. A few of them are sort of special purpose for, for India. So on the left, it's a woman's most important role is being a good homemaker. So 77% of boys and 57% of girls agree or strongly agree with that statement. So I'm pretty sure if you ask that in Washington, D.C. or you know, many other parts of the world, you would see much lower support for that. Uh, and on the right, it's should boys get more opportunities and resources for education than girls? Again, you know, a very large a majority of both boys and girls agree with that statement. So this pattern, another pattern you'll see here that is true overall is that girls have more support for gender equality than boys. So there's a, there's a pretty big gender gap, but uh, there's room for improvement for the girls as well. So we have three main outcomes. We pre-specified three outcomes that are all indices that combine several questions. So one is gender attitude. So those two questions from baseline, we have those questions at endline and several others. Uh, another is girls' aspirations, their educational and career goals. And then the last is a gender behavior index. You know, I think in the long run, we're most interested, or I'm most interested in thinking about the behavioral changes. In the short run, these kids don't have a lot of autonomy over their actions. So we focused on questions where they have some ability to shape their own behavior. So for example, boys doing more chores or girls doing fewer chore, chores, girls' mobility outside of the home, whether they interact with the, with the opposite sex. Okay, so here are the main result, the results of this project uh, in one slide, which is, uh, what are the effects on, on attitudes, aspirations, and behavior. So this first bar, and this is all measured in standard deviation. So the control group has a standard deviation of one, so we see a 0.25 standard deviation improvement in gender attitude. So these are coded, so a higher number means more support for gender equality. We see no impact on girls' aspirations. You know, in fact, girls' aspirations aren't that different from boys at at baseline. I don't know if that's good or bad, but you know, many more girls want to want and plan to go to college or have a career than probably is realistic, at least in the control group. And we also see a big impact on behaviors related that are governed by gender attitudes. So you know, are these how do you know standard deviations are a strange unit, so is this big or small? Here are two benchmarks that I find useful. So one is at baseline, we collected attitude data from a subset of parents, so we could look at if a parent has a one standard deviation, more support for gender equality, what is the association with their child's gender attitudes? And it's 0.11. 
So the effect of this program was about twice as large as this association of your parrot having one standard deviation, more progressive views. You know, so on the one hand, that's really surprising. They've been living with these parents, with their parents for 12 years. But you know, I, I think this is, you know, it's quite different to have 27 hours of explicit discussion you know, versus sort of implicit messaging. Another benchmark is I said girls have more progressive attitudes than boys. That's about 0.68 standard deviations. So a boy who went through this program wasn't as progressive as a girl who didn't go through it, but it's pretty sizable relative to that gap. You know, another metric that Stefano Delavigna has, has encouraged uh, economists to, to measure or to, to express effect sizes in it is as a persuasion rate. So this is a persuasion campaign. And so of the people who held uh, views that were not supportive of gender equality. So, you know, of those 77% of boys who said a woman's most important role is a homemaker, 14% of those uh, people switched their view by going through this program. So it's not 100%. You know, this is obviously not enough to completely change gender attitudes, but it's a pretty sizable dent in the problem, you know, especially when you think you can imagine the marginal cost of this kind of program being pretty low, so you could not just run it for two years, you could start it earlier and run it um, for more years. Okay, so one thing I'll just briefly say is one thing that you should probably be thinking about and a little worried about is social desirability bias. The uh, treatment group knows what the right answers are and they might um, you know, sort of give us answers just to, to look good. So we use a tool developed by social psychologists to measure an individual's tendency to give socially desirable answers. And it would be, what would be worrisome if our answers were all driven by people who tend to give socially desirable answers. Uh, luckily, this isn't the case. So first, just briefly, uh, I, I, as, a, as a plug for this method, I think it's, it's pretty powerful. It, it seems to work well in our setting, and I'll say what I mean by work well. It has nothing to do with gender equality. It's just asking you if you have too good to be tr true traits, like never being jealous of someone else's success. And so people who are never jealous of anybody else or who never give up on things they're bad at, they might be saintly, but it's more likely it's a signature of giving socially desirable answers. So when I say it works, you know, this is, this is what I've circled is people who have a low tendency to say they're, you know, who don't give answers that make themselves look good, uh, they have less support for gender equality. So this is, you know, overall, it seems like people are shading their answer a little bit um, to, to make them look good to themselves or the surveyor. But, you know, we don't, what would be worrisome is if there was a big negative interaction effect. You know, if when we looked at the people who had a low tendency to give socially desirable answers, we didn't see the program had any benefit. You know, we don't see that pattern at all. In other words, these effects are true for both for people who give socially desirable answers and for people who have a very low tendency to do that. So that's um, reassuring. You know, the last result I'll show you is that we see a similar improvement in gender attitudes for both boys and girls. That's on the left. The boys start out with worse views, they improve. The girls start out with better views, they also improve. Where we see a stark gender difference is in the self-reported behavior. And we didn't sort of pre-specify this or think, think about too hard that, to expect this, but in hindsight, it makes sense in the sense that boys have fewer constraints on their behavior. So if you believe something, you still need to push back against your parents or other people in society to do that. And so some of this is you know, built in asymmetry, like boys volunteer to do more chores. That's very different from a girl convincing her parents she, it's unfair that she's doing that many chores. But we also see it for things that don't have that built in asymmetry, like boys seem to have more um, comfort pushing back on their parents to let their older sisters go to school. And as I said, you know, in hindsight, this isn't very, this is, this is not surprising, um, but it does mean, you know, it, it reinforces the importance of involve, kind of for a maybe unfortunate reason, it's very important to involve boys in these kind of pro pro programs because they might have more power to act on them later. So, you know, now I expect when we track these kids later, you know, we might see more female employment increases in the wives of the boys who participated because they can push back on their parents then we see for the girls who participate in the program, because they have a harder challenge of convincing their husbands and their in-laws to let them work, but you know, we'll see. And that's where we're going with this. Right now, we have another survey in the field to see, did the attitude change persist? Do we see differences in girls' school enrollment? We added some revealed preference measures of 
behavior, like seeing if girls will fill out a tedious scholarship form for college, which they should be more likely to do if they want to and expect to go to college. And then, you know, the longer run, as I said, we hope to, to track the sample uh, to, to see if, you know, assuming attitude change persists, to see uh, whether this, the changed attitudes translates in, into some of these important behaviors like the skewing of the sex ratio and, and female employment in India. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Seema. Uh, I'm sure there'll be quite a few questions, so, uh, and we have some, uh, what, 20 minutes, so let's uh, open it up. You can, you okay, can great. join me here if you like. Uh, so the floor is open. Okay. Clearly, okay. So thank you. So um, one thing that I think it's important to stress uh, in, I love the, the global overview of, of the literature, but the step on sex ratio being bad, because unless you take a stand on abortion, which is a big issue, and I don't want to, um, then those girls not being born, it's not so clear that that's that bad. So the link to conflict or to other things is very important in terms of uh, uh, we avoid uh, dipping into the abortion thing, um, making the last link on the sex ratio being bad. Thanks. Uh, thanks, girls. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the economics doesn't have a great welfare, uh, you know, welfare metric for the unborn. You probably know, like, Michelle Tertilt has, has, has thought about this. But you know, I think there is a kind of a view of welfare where we can think of a counterfactual of those girls uh, being born. But I also think it has a, it's a chilling effect on girls uh, who do, who are born, you know. So there are some qualitative narratives of, you know, just imagine once you know this exists, how girls who are, uh, who are alive, what it tells them about how they're valued, et cetera. So I think, you know, one can make an argument, even without turning to civil conflict, to think of it as a human rights, um, bio, you know, violation. Um, so that, you know, I guess that's, that's my take on it, that the civil arrest is, is important, and it's certainly maybe most important for driving government attention to this, but that, um, you know, even without that, uh, it has some negative consequences in terms of the welfare of women and girls. Um, first of all, thank you, thank you very much for coming and for, for a very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to follow up on this question because I, I was thinking along the same lines uh, as you were talking. Um, so we're, we're all in favor of eliminating inequality once uh, someone is born, but um, the kind of, of you know, of, of inequality you are talking about, selective abortion in particular, is a little tricky from a philosophical point of view because it leads one to take a stand as to when life starts, which of course is an extremely controversial topic uh, here. <laughs> but but you know, if you have a, a, a solution that involves legal action, for example, outlawing selective abortion, uh, uh, sex selective abortion, uh, the next step is, the natural next step is to, to uh, to uh, uh, outlaw abortion as a whole, because you know the, the premise is that uh, that uh, girls are a human life before they're born, so it's very hard to justify killing a human life, you know, b before before it has come, uh, before the kids are born. Um, so, so if you are going to justify from an economic point of view, I, I think this is possible actually, because there has been a lot of work, especially on China, on how. The sex imbalance has affected savings, for example, violence, and so on. So I think it might be easier to justify it from a, from a from from an economic point of view rather than from an ethical or philosophical point of view. Uh. Yeah. So I, I, I sort of highlighted this point about uh, the sort of like what the feminist agenda, you know, that sort of the of supporting a access to abortion and then having this uh, sort of worsen the the problem of the skewed sex ratio. I think they are in conflict. I think it makes it very tricky for uh, to to talk about the sex ratio and to sort of advocate for addressing it. You know, where there is this worry that it's going to to hurt access to um, 
access to a, a abortion. You know, I think there are also, it's, there are other unintended consequences. So, you know, the, I think there's like okay evidence, but certainly a, like a theoretical idea that it, this is enabling girls to be born into families that want them more. And so, you know, conditional on being born, they might be treated more equitably. So there's a composition effect on who's having daughters and sons. So, you know, I think it's, there's some like many tricky things that could, that are, um, you know, sort of like silver linings, or et, et cetera. So, you know, I, I, I guess the, it might be sufficient to make an argument, you know, why we should be worried about the sex ratio just on, um, you know, violence and other uh, other aspects. I guess I don't. I I, I think there is a, a human rights uh, aspect to it. So you know whether that's compelling in in pol you know if your try if your goal was to to get policy action on this you know whether that's compelling or one should sort of have a narrower focus on the the violence. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm probably I don't shy away as much from from saying that. You know, there's a human rights violation, but also being attentive to the slippery slope about abortion rights that you're you're mentioning. So um, it's more a comment, and I think Seema, I, I, I support your your the, the way you're sort of tackling the problem, because often what's when we talk about sun preference and the way it's manifested, especially in India and China, you know, it's it's through the sex slave abortion, policymakers are then drawn towards addressing the action that's leading to the manifestation in the demographic uh, you know, statistics we look at. Whereas what you're saying, especially the, 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 the study that you just talked about, is you can address the same sun preference resulting in these um, unintended or, or, or consequences we, we would not expect with development by trying to change what's underlying um, the, the sun preference. So it's, it's, it's not, I think there is a tendency to sort of attach and say, because sex selective abortions are the main way in which people are expressing their sun preference, let's stop that particular action. Whereas I think it's important through research to shift the focus of what are the policy op options. And none of those are going to work immediately. It's going to take time. But I think it's really important for us to also recognize that their sun preference can result in these um, unintended consequences, you know, even if you reform you know, land reform, all these property rights reforms, all of these things will not necessarily work for women uh, as long as there's a sun preference. And I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, it's not a debate about abortion or not abortion. It's a debate about really tackling the fundamentals, which is why I think this is great work. Thank you. I was taken aback by the numbers you showed on some of the Central Asian countries. I thought that you mentioned briefly, um, just a very interesting, uh, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I guess uh, you mentioned that they may have different reasons. So I was wondering if you'd like to elaborate on those a little bit in terms of how they differ from your experience with India and China. Yeah, so I'm not an expert on the, uh, the Caucasus, but I, I think it's actually the, the the demographers who have worked on this have pointed to th that you know there was a, in place there's always been in place this sort of strong patrilocal patril patrilineal traditions, and then uh, kind of in the Soviet era there w was access to abortion, but what happened with the fall of communism was a decline in you know from a fertility level of 2.5 to 1.2 1.3 very quickly, so exactly this desire to have a son coming into conflict with just wanting one child. So, you know, sort of, but not coerced like a one child policy, but a really strong desire to have just one child. Why that is, you know, why fertility fell that much, I don't know, you know, I assume it has to do with the economic turmoil. And now this is like speculating, but it's, you know, I think it, I, I can also imagine that desire to have a son you know, my point was that you just keep the desire to have a son fixed and fertility falls, that's enough to worsen it. It's possible that desire to have a son becomes stronger in, you know, in, with the upheaval, and I don't, I don't know that. that. Oh, up. Um, this is another touchy question, but to what extent is religion associated with the skewed uh, son ratio? Is it, uh, do you see that to be a very significant impact? Yeah, so like in, in India, the sex ratio is much more skewed among Hindus than Muslims. So it's um, uh, it's skewed kind of overall, and, and 
you know, in India is, is uh, say, worse than Bangladesh. So it's so there is a religion, religious component, but um, yeah, so it's it's like Hinduism, and I think you know, I think there's some conf Confucian traditions, but my sense from talking to people who work on China is that it's not as um, you know as central to to the reasons in China, but yeah, I think Hinduism. I, and so I don't know, therefore, what if the, I, I don't know if there's a religious component in the Caucasus. Uh, Hi, I'm going to move away from the sun preference to this really cool social norms work that you've been doing. So one thing, which is just a comment, I mean, I think as you highlighted, using volunteers to scale up is actually crucial because other similar initiatives like GEMS, gender equity, has just not worked because they try to first teach the teachers, which they're not able to do, uh, and then it doesn't end up working. I just had a question on, did you uh, look at spillover? So first is, how long was these training sessions? I, I think I just missed that, like how long they were. And the other is, have you looked at spillovers at all? Like, do boys actually continue to you know, sort of fight uh, for the women who they now think should be treated a certain way outside of when they're in the classroom. And uh, the other question on the same topic was, if you looked at anonymity, so you know, with the social desirability, did you play around with the like, anonymity in response at all to see if that had a role to play? Great. Um, so the, the sessions were 45 minutes to an hour. So 27, it was basically a, that block of time, 27 times over the two and a half years. Um, so, you know, in, in tracking the kids right now, we're asking about some of the, like, this time we're doing a, a list experiment to ask about sexual harassment, for example, um, and sort of some of the, you know, and these behavior, the self-reported behaviors are, in, include things that are about, you know, standing up for, for sisters or what they perpetrate um, themselves. And so, in this original survey that, that I presented, we didn't do kind of any, anything uh, about anonymous versus um, naming yourself. But what we're trying to do with, with this next, what we currently have in the field is to, to, to try to address social desirability is like we're asking them to sign a petition uh, that's related to a, a pro-gender policy where we're going to publish the names in the local newspaper and forward the list of names. So they're, it's public, you know, so, so that will be one way to see if there's a distinction between what they'll say privately to us versus what they will say publicly. I should note on social norms, you know, there's been some recent work that says like part, maybe one way to change people, what people do is not to change what they truly believe, but what they think other people believe. So there's some nice work by Leo Burstein and David Yana Gazala Drott that tells people that other people in Saudi Arabia support women's employment and then they are, are more supportive of their um, wife working or Betsy Pollock has worked on this. And so we, you know, that wasn't the the strategy of this program, but we do see it has an effect on that view of the social norm. So people also think, you know, the community writ large is more supportive of gender equality. So if we see if impacts later on, you know, part of it could be about not just changing what their own views were, but sort of changing their perception of what's right and accepted in society. Michelle? So along these lines, I was wondering if you would considered measuring peer effects um, of children who weren't exposed to the intervention, but are friends with those who were? Yeah, so the way we did this, you know, that I think, I guess like all, we, we didn't have a lot of treatment arms to get at things through the design, like peer effects. We thought about serving the younger siblings. That would be a kind of a natural, relatively low cost kind of group where you might expect some spillovers on their younger siblings. We treated an entire cohort in a school. So that's going to be a lot of who they, they associated with, but we could also think about, you know, a younger grade in the, the same school. My guess is like the, the younger siblings might be the, the most promising way to think about the, the spillovers. I mean, it's also possible, we're going back to survey the parents later on. I, maybe I'm too pessimistic. Maybe there will be uh, changes in what their parents think as well. So we could also look at that. Thank you so much, Professor. This was an extremely insightful talk. Um, so I'm going to move a little bit on the sex ratios project, which you talked about. And I was particularly intrigued by the channel on how female education um, and the preference to, for a smaller family size could actually perpetuate and worsen the problem of sex ratios. And I'm wondering if the project also sheds any light on who might be the key decision makers when it comes to sex-selective abortion. 
whether it's the man, the woman, or the parents-in-law, or perhaps an interplay of all of them. I know this is very difficult to pin down, specifically because these activities are outside the legal purview, but I'm wondering if there are any proxies or any such instruments which were used in these projects, because I think in the long run, um, they can really inform us on how targeted policy interventions on, uh, you know, on elements within the household can actually help. Yeah, so my work, I don't think I have a great answer from my work uh, on how much it's the woman versus the man, and it's probably what you said is kind of all of the above, as well as in-laws and extended family playing, playing a role. So um, I know you, I think you saw in this lecture series Nancy Chen's work in China you know, where women having more bargaining power um, led to a less skewed sex ratio, suggesting that women have some role uh, role in it, but I don't think they have, you know, exclusive say in, in what happens. Sam. Oh, I just wanted to hear more about where this work is going and where you see either the cutting edge of figuring out how to transmit what we see to be better norms or alternatives, whether it's lowering the cost of having girls or increasing the benefits or you name it. Yeah, so the, uh, I, it's, it's a good question that I'm sort of struggling, not struggling with, but you know, having to wrestle with myself because I think we are having conversations with the government of, um, of, you know, how might they scale it up? So I think part of me thinks, okay, that's where I should spend my attention, you know, doing what I call A/B testing, where there isn't necessarily academic research as a goal, but to help them think about what's the right dosage, what are different models, could you, how much of the effect could you get if you did this sort of implicitly in textbooks rather than hired staff. You know, I think there are also some interesting um, intellectual questions about uh, some around spillovers or complementarities between sort of getting a, a critical mass to, to change attitudes. And so I think that's also um, interesting for research. You know, I think this idea of, of getting to, figuring out policies to get at the root attitudes is important. And, you know, we, we use this one approach of kids in schools with this program. I don't, you know, there, there's a lot broader, a, lot, a much larger set of policies that are still trying to, to change the attitudes. You know, and I said I, I uh, kind of counter-proposed to the government not to evaluate their incentives. But doing this project, I'm now quite curious to evaluate those. You know, just because that might not be sufficient, I think it is an empirical question whether, you know, it could be it's an experience good. Having a daughter makes you um, like having daughters more and it erodes this, this aversion to not having any sons. Or it could be this intrinsic mo extrinsic motivation crowds out intrinsic motivation. I think that's certainly like a more immediate policy if, if your goal was the sex ratio. So I at least have a renewed interest in, in evaluating that, or at least um, someone should. Okay, oh, one last question. Thanks for the interesting talk on your uh, RCT at the end. And I was very curious, what were the behaviors? The behaviors was, a, was an index over a set of behaviors. And there must have been some that moved more and some that moved less, even some that you expected to that didn't. And I wanted to hear a little more about what made up when it comes down to it that set of behaviors changing? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a little, you know, it's, a, it's essentially it was a set of things that we thought would be changed with gender attitudes that kids have some autonomy over. So we didn't see m much change in, uh, or big, uh, like an impressive change in girls' m mobility, which suggests they either don't have autonomy of, over it or they do, but they have other concerns like safety, et cetera. You know, we saw, um, we generally saw more movement among boys and girls. You know, so I, uh, I, as I mentioned briefly, like boys start doing more chores or you know, report doing more chores. And this is one where I, see, you know, I think there's kind of a built-in asymmetry because they can, they might have some pushback from doing more chores, and, and girls uh, don't have a reduction. We also see more interaction with the opposite sex, which I guess in some settings you might say, why is that a measure of of gender equality, but this is a society where there's a, you know, where there's a setting where there's just a, maybe an unhealthy level of gender segregation such that part of it was like making them more comfortable with and wanting to you know, interact with the opposite sex. So that one was one where we saw a movement on, you know, uh, and again, it's like something in school that they have some autonomy about. We didn't, in some ways, we didn't ask certain questions where they almost surely wouldn't have 
autonomy over. Um, so in that sense, you know, they were sort of stacked to have some ability to, to move. Okay, I think we actually saw an example of this today. Uh, we've been having a discussion, Burke Osler and a few of us, about how in seminars in the research department, <laughs> almost all the questions are asked by men. And I read somewhere an article where they said if the chair calls on a woman first, there's a greater likelihood for more women to participate in the discussion. And today I did that. I called on Garance, and the first eight speakers were all women. So this <laughs> might be an example of uh, how we can uh, each do a little bit to uh, change, the, uh, uh, change the balance. So on that note, let me thank Seema, and jo please join me in uh, thanking the speaker.